good week and that we are ready to continue into our studies. Um, before we go there, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you Lord for life, health and strength that you have graciously given unto us Lord. Lord, we know that there is nothing good in us and that is what you have revealed to us even through your word. And we can only come before you now because of what Christ has done for us. And we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word unmolested. And to understand these things that they may strengthen us in our daily walk. And oh Lord, how, how hard sometimes these things are to move from just concepts and ideas into reality. And how we live. But Lord, what is impossible for man is possible for you, Lord. And we ask for your strength, your divine strength even as it mingles with our human effort, that we may be able to perform the things that we are hearing and we are seeing and we are learning. Lord, we know it's only by your power that anything can be done. And we ask that for that power, through your Holy Spirit, even to be with us. May our minds be attentive, even today our, our, our minds be enlightened and our hearts, Lord, Father, be ready and willing to not just be hearers, but also doers of your word. Be it all those who are here and all those who will hear even through the media and other resources, and we pray, Lord, that your blessing will attend even unto them also. Be with me in speech in, and in, pre in presentation, that as I speak, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will fill me and I will be able to present the things that only you would want your people to hear and understand, God. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with us even as we come to the completion of these studies, and that they will be a blessing to us, our families, and all those who are here, in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, as we continue into our study, we will actually go back to our text. We know our principal text. I believe you all should know these texts by now. The first text is taken from Matthew chapter 24 verse, verse, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. And every time I repeat these texts, I'm not just saying these texts. We want these texts. Some people may be newly listening to these presentations, and I want them to have the basis of where this series of presentations has come from. So we have Matthew 24, verse 14, and it says there, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then the end shall come. So the end is not coming until this gospel. And when the Bible says this gospel, it's speaking about a specific gospel. The next text is going to clarify it a little more for us. Um, Galatians chapter 1, verse, from verse 6 to verse 9. Galatians 1, 6 to 9. So Paul here now is going to clarify and make a little more clarity. He says, I marvel that ye are soon removed from him that called you on into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, O an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. So these texts are laid the foundation for our study. Now we are in section four, which is the last section. So we went through four sections. Each section had four parts. This section also has four parts. And what are we going to be studying in this section? What is biblical perfection? What is biblical perfection? And this, this word here seems to be a very bad word in Christianity today. Anytime you hear about perfection, everybody is always you know, wary about this word and they don't want to hear about this at all. But let us see exactly what the Bible says about perfection. This is lesson number 13. And is perfection really possible? Do we believe perfection is possible? Do we believe that? Or we better believe it else as Brother Jermaine said this morning, the gospel should not be preached. We should be just, just close, up the, close up the church and just go home. If we don't believe that this is possible, right? It may be difficult, but it's not impossible, right? And we really want to make it difficult. 
Perfection is a troublesome word. We agree? What does it really mean? What does it what does it mean? Some believe that it is spiritually unhealthy to emphasize the subject of perfection. But perhaps part of the problem is that we have not defined our terms carefully. Let us take a close look at this much avoided subject to see if it is as fearsome as it seems. Perfection has how many meanings? Four, Four different meanings. Which may be part of the reason it is misunderstood. So how many, how many meanings does perfection have? Four. So let's go through and see what we, we're going to deal with here now. Question number one. How is God described? How is God described? Malachi 3.6, it says what? For I am the Lord, I, I change not. I, for I am the Lord, I change not. True or false? Someone said false. Everyone agree with false? Nobody's answering. Anybody agree with false? Yes, it's false. God does not change periodically. God does not change. He himself has declared that about himself. Only God can be described in this way. Only who? Only God can be described in this way. Only God never needs to change or adjust his thinking or actions based on new information. What is going to be new information for God? God wouldn't get any new information, right? Since God knows all things past, present, and future, there is no possibility that he will be surprised by any new information. No created beings, no what? Created beings, including who? Angels can be described in this way. For all are subject to new information which will change their ideas and actions. Lack of information will always lead to imprecise and perhaps wrong conclusions. And we still have to put with a whole host of angels in the beginning, right? One third of them were deceived, right? Um, the, oh, as I learned from a teacher, God is the only one who never learns. He doesn't learn because learning means that you have to get something new information. God, he knows everything already, right? He knows everything already. How is Jesus described? How is Jesus described? Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever. True or false? Based on that text. Anyone? True or false? Based on the text we said before. True? I mean false. Let's see. Yes, it's false. Again, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he does not change periodically. Since Jesus is described in the same way as God, it is clear that he shares this unique attribute of God. This is what? This is absolute perfection. It means that there will never be a mistake made or misjudgment based on quality information. Sometimes it is said that human beings can never be absolutely perfect. This is correct because absolute perfection describes what? God alone. So this perfection, we cannot attain unto this because this is an attribute of who alone? Of God alone. God is the only one who can be described as absolute perfection. So that's one of the first definitions. Let's continue. Our high calling, page 45, it says there, there is no other absolute perfection. Thus, absolute perfection is never possible for what? Created beings. Not for human beings and not for angels. Angelic perfection failed where? In heaven, human perfection failed where? In Eden. So as we see here, the prophet is telling us that only God can be described as absolute perfect. Okay, let's continue. How was man created? How was man created? Genesis 1, 27 and 31. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. So God said that everything was very good. 
What's the answer? Answer is what? C. Let's see. Yes, the answer is C. You know that A and B is supported by what community? Those who believe in what theory? Theory of evolution. Right? They believe that we were imperfect in the beginning and because of a series of, you know, the series of death and dying and morphing and genetic change over millions of years, we have improved and become the the, it's the, the outstanding men and women that we are today. And because of that, we are continuing upward. Man is becoming better and better because we were, we were, we were lowly animals. That's what they believe. But that is not what the Bible has revealed to us. It reveals, it reveals to us that in the beginning, God created man in his image and he was very good. So we started very good and what happened? We are declining. But man says, no, we started off little lowly creatures and we are what going up see how this is the ego of man right god created adam and eve in the full perception that is possible to finite beings he made mankind in his own image as close to god as could possibly be cre possible for created beings this is what nature perfection man's very nature was in complete harmony with god and the rest of creation his mind and body work perfectly together. He doesn't have to fight discordant feelings and emotions. His impulses and drives were in balance and in complete agreement with God's laws. Everything works properly. Oh, I would have loved to live in a world like that, sir. Eh? Just everything works properly, right? Sometimes it's kind of hard for us to understand this, but that is how it was in the beginning. And this is what it's called what? Nature perfection. So we thought before we had absolute perfection, which can only be said of God, but here we have nature perfection, which can be said of finite beings. Question number four. What will happen to us at the resurrection? What will happen to us at the resurrection? So, also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, in, dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 40, and 52 to 53. What's the answer? Someone says A and B. Any other answers? You are sure not see? Sure, let's see the answer. Yes, A and B. We receive immortality at the resurrection and we receive immortality in a moment. This one applies to what? Those who remain alive. This one applies to those who have died. Right? This is what most of people believe, unfortunately. In Christianity, that when you die, you go around to the wrong way, right? That's 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 incorrect. The Bible never teaches that. Our corruptible, sinful human nature will be changed by God at the second coming of Christ into an incorruptible, perfect human nature. So when does our sinful human nature change? When does it change? At the second coming. After that time, there will be no more sinful prompting from within our nature. This nature perfection, which involves removal of temptations from within, will occur only at the second coming of Christ. We cannot experience nature perfection before then. We cannot experience what? Nature perfection before then. So this whole process here will only be possible at the second coming of Christ. I wanted to pay attention to this eh, because this is very important. This is where we get mixed up a lot in Christianity and how we look at the, uh, how we look at perfection that causes a lot of problems in the church. Question number five: How much of our heart does God ask for? How much of our heart does God ask for? Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord with thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Answer? 
true or false? True? Let's see. Yes, the, uh, it's true. God asks for all our hearts and minds. At the moment of conversion, when we surrender our lives completely to Christ, we are counted perfect in Christ. The one thing that God asks of us is asks of us in the conversion process is to give him our whole heart. He will not accept a divided heart in which we love God and the world equally. The one condition we must meet to be saved is total and complete surrender of our entire life to God. He will accept nothing less. Even though we are just beginning our walk with Christ, He accepts our what? Character surrender and we are counted perfect in Christ. Now you notice you see character surrender in bold, right? Let's see what, what we can say about that. How does a plant reveal this process? How does a plant reveal this process? For the earth bringing forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the air, then, sorry, after that the full corn in the air. Mark 4.28. True or false? Yes, that is true. So the blade is as necessary as the right fruit. So at that process, when it's just the blade alone, it's the plant is what? It's perfect at that point. Because that's all that is expected. When the plant continues to grow and bear fruit, it is perfect at that point. So we see at successive stages we can be perfect, even though we may not be fully developed. Let's see, let's see this growth out more as we continue. Even though a plant is very immature when the first blade of green grass appears above the ground, it is no less important than the fully grown plant. Would you agree with that, right? Okay. Without the first growth, no harvest will be possible. The tiny blade is perfect because it is all that could be expected to be. At each stage of growth, the plant may be perfect as it grows to maturity. Likewise, when our character is fully surrendered to God, that is a perfect surrender at that time, with the knowledge available to us then. We are fully surrendered to the degree that we understand ourselves and God's will for us. God will accept the full surrender of all that we know about ourselves at that time. Our character surrender is what? Our character surrender is what? It's perfect because it is counted as perfect. I mean, we dealt with that in previous studies by God. Incidentally, this is the only requirement for salvation. Now or in the future. God does not demand wisdom or education or long years of living as is illustrated in the story of the thief on the cross. What is God's plan for us? Till we come, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.23 Answer? Let's see the answer. So I mean B, let's see if that's the answer. Yes, God expects us to grow to maturity. While God is very gracious to give us time to learn and develop, He calls us perfect during that time. He wants us to grow up to full maturity. He even says that we can grow to the stature of the fullness of Christ. The gospel is a tremendous power that God is willing to share with us, to bring us a height that we could never imagine. Amen? Yes, that is the power of the gospel. Character maturity is simply the ripening of the harvest in the individual life. We are becoming mature in Christ when we are no longer choosing to sin against God. When we no, no longer what? No, we no longer choose to sin against God, so we can choose to do that. If Jesus does live within us through the process of justification and sanctification, then when he controls our lives, we do not sin because Christ does not sin. It's as simple as that. That's what the Bible presents to us. 
Question number eight. What can God accomplish in us? What can who? Who accomplishes in us? God accomplishes in us. First John 3 9. Whosoever is born of God does not what? Commit sin. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. The Bible says that he what? It doesn't say he may not sin. Or he, he might not sin. It says he what? Cannot sin. That's an impossibility. It's impossible for the person to because who sees him in him? Who is he here? Or who is he here? His seed remains in him. Who is he? Christ. Christ's seed remains in us. And when Christ is in us, because Christ does not sin, we do not we do not sin. What's the answer? I'm here A and A and C. Anybody else? Let's see. Yes, A and C. God's plan is that we do not sin and the new birth makes it possible for us to stop sinning. You know, this has become now the default understanding in most people's Christian experience, right? It's inevitable. It is gonna, it's, gonna, it's not inevitable. The concept can be expressed in a simple but clear way. Christ in, sin out. Sin in, Christ out. We cannot have both Christ and sin reigning on the throne of the life at the same time. Christ will not accept a divided heart. In a mature character, Christ is controlling totally. And therefore, we are not making rebellious choices. We are choosing not to rebel against God in thought, word, or action. Right here, we are focusing on what God can do, not on what I can't do. That is the gospel there. You know, a lot of times you think about, oh, I can't do that. I can't. It's, not, it's not what you can do. Then you should be focused on. You should, you should be focused on what? What God can do. And if we can, if we change our mindset to so what God can do through us rather than what we can't do, we might see some some different life, some different lifestyles. And even what we talked about this morning with respect to changing diet, you know, people say, oh, I can't give up cheese and I can't do this and I can't do that. It's not what you can't do. It's what God can do through you. We can do, I mean, you know, we say this text a lot, like in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ. You notice how we can do it there? It's only through Christ. So in conclusion, in defining perfection, we have found that the two definitions that are important for our study are those categories which we have some control. If we believe that sin is by choice, then we also believe that we can choose to obey. We can choose to surrender we can choose to grow to maturity. Because Christ provides the power for victory, a perfectly mature character like Christ is possible for all surrendered Christians. Amen. The new birth brings perfection in Christ, which is always sufficient for salvation. We are saved on condition of complete surrender. On condition of what? Complete surrender. The problem is that we interrupt our surrender to Christ. And we know about that all too well. The power of Christ does not change, but our surrender to Christ is not constant. It is the interruption that can and should cease. For we should let Christ control us totally at all times. Amen? By nature, we will always be sinful until Christ comes. By what? By nature. Remember, we dealt with that, right? We dealt with nature perfection, and then we dealt with character perfection. We can, we can deal with the character when? No. But we can, be, we can only deal with the nature. Well, we will even be dealing with the nature. Who deals with the nature? God deals with the nature of who we are at when? When at the second coming of Christ. But when? But we can decide to make no choice against God's will. We can actually have a sinless character in our Sinful nature. That 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 you think that sounds right? Is that even possible? Read that again in bold. We can actually have a sinless character in our sinful nature. And we dealt with the, we dealt with Christ. Remember, we dealt with Christ and who he was and was a, a real human being. He came in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh, but he, he did not sin. He had a perfect character. And what God is calling us to reach? He's calling us to reach that full measure in Christ Jesus. 
possess as Christ lived on this earth, we can live the exact same way. That is why Christ came to show, that, show us that it is not impossible. If Christ overcame the promptings of his fallen nature by the Holy Spirit's control, then the same power is available to us. You believe that? And I believe that. And I also believe that I make a lot of interruptions in that full surrender. And God help us to come to that point where we do not choose to sin. So it is possible for us to have a perfect character or sinless character in a sinful nature. God deals with our character now and he deals with our nature at the second coming of Christ. So yes, something does change at the second coming of Christ, but it's not our character. It is what? This corruptible flesh. So there's not going to be any prompting to sin from within our flesh. That is what changes at Christ's second coming. But now we can deal with the character. And how we deal with it? By allowing Christ full control over our entire being. So we're going again, what is biblical per perfection? Lesson 14. This is the hard, this is, this is, this is what we think hard here, right? This is what some people think. But let's see the truth of what the Bible presents to us. Victory over sin. Is it possible? Is it not possible? Right? While definitions are very important in understanding perfection, it may be even more important to search the Bible for realistic, practical ways of experience, experiencing what the Bible promises. It is at this point that we need to have that faith, that complete trust in God, that we be, that will believe what God says, even though it somehow it's something possible. We know enough about our weaknesses and our failures. What we want to know is God's power and His promises. Question number one: What can Christ do? So we focusing on Christ. What can Christ do? Now unto him that is able to keep you from doing what? From falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now you notice with this text, who keeps you? Him, who's the him? Christ, right? And he, who presents you? He presents you also. So he keeps you and he presents you. What? Faultless. So it's not about us. It's about God and Christ. What they can do. Answer? I'm here in A. Okay, I'm here in A and C. Let's see. Yes, A and C. Christ can keep us from falling into sin, and Christ can present us faultless in his presence. You notice where he focuses? The focus is on Christ. Is Christ really able to keep us from sinning? Or is sin in the final analysis more powerful than Christ? Under inspiration, Jude says that he is able. Thus, falling in, falling is not an inevitable, an inevitable reality of our lives. No matter what our past experience might have been, if Christ is really able, then why don't we give him a chance to reveal his power in our lives? And that's really the problem there, right? We don't give him that chance. We don't give him that chance. Oh Lord, give me, Lord, I want to give him that chance. I pray for myself, because I know. Right? We need to give Christ a chance. Question number two. How much can we really do? How much can we really do? How much things can we really do? I can do what? All things. All things to Christ which strengthen me. Now, you notice this. They didn't say I can do all things. And they say which strengthen me. It says through Christ. It always has to be through Christ. Philippians 4, 13. A well-known text. But I don't think we believe that text. It's a nice saying. True or false? I mean, false, very emphatically in front. Let's see. Yeah, that's false. Not most things. That's how some of us live. But we can do all things. Do we really believe the promises of God? And that way it comes down to where if we really believe. Are all things possible to Christ? Is it really true that victory over sin is possible? Note carefully that this is possible only through Christ dwelling in us by the process of justification and sanctification. Only possible through Christ. 
What else does God promise? Second Peter 2 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Again, B. Anybody else? Any other answer? Let's see the answer. God will deliver the godly from temptation. Not anyone. And not the ungodly. Right? It is important to note that God will deliver only those who are looking to him and believing his promises. Whom he calls the godly. Now, if we are really delivered out of temptation, this means that we have not fallen under the temptation. We have not sinned. Then it is necessary for us, then it is not necessary for us to yield to temptation because he can deliver us from temptation. He will provide a way of escape if we are willing. How will God deliver us? Well, don't text again too. They had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a what? A way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So every single temptation that comes to us on a daily basis, God has made a way of escape. The question is, do we look for the way of escape, or do we just say, no, 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 no. I need to share, I need to get them, I need to rest it on them. Or, you know, we, we, we just put God aside and we just take up the mountain and we run hard. But with every temptation, God makes a way of escape. And that means that if there's a way of escape for every temptation, that we, we do not need to fall into any temptation. Answer? <laughs> Some people say C. What? What is it? B? Let's see. Yes, there is a way of escape for every temptation. You know, some people believe this, right? They say, why? They may know what I go through, you know. They may know. But the Bible says there is no temptation that I take you, that is what? Common to the man. So there is no temptation that you will face that another man will face, who has, has not faced, right? And some people believe A. But if you believe A, then we should just close up the church. God is more powerful than any temptation that can come to us. God has promised that he... Who has promised? God. God has promised that he will not allow any temptation to... God has promised that he will not allow any temptation to come to us that is too strong for us, which will make our fall inevitable. This means that a way of escape is possible for every temptation. There is not one temptation that comes to us that makes sin inevitable. I'm going to repeat that again. There is not one temptation that comes to us that makes sin inevitable. God has promised that if we will trust in him, he will show us the way out of every temptation. Amen? Yes. Thank the Lord. And the thing about it is this, eh? you know, when you see and you do something and it's like, God is like, I know you can, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Trust in me. And we've we gone off on a tangent. God is like, they didn't, they didn't hold fast. And we do, how many times do we do that? Throughout the day. Oh my Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord. Some practical ways, because this has to be practical, eh? as it makes no sense. It wouldn't make any sense. Some practical ways to find out that escape route can be easily done if we give some thought to it ahead of time. When temptation comes, do we pray immediately? Or will we rather wait until later? Have we memorized scriptures so that we can answer Satan with it is written, as Christ did? We can even find a way of escape by song. What is important is that we turn our thoughts away from the temptation and towards our source of power. So we see three ways here. One way is what? Pray. The other way is what? Memorize the of scripture. And the other way is song. Sing a song. Sing a song. Some of us might be singing holy. Right? <laughs> Question number five. How did Christ live? How did Christ live? 2 Peter 2, 22, 23. Or oh, 21 to 22, sorry. But even here unto 
were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that he should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. See, that's the answer. We know that Christ lived a, a life without sin, but sometimes we don't want to recognize the fact that he is also our example, asking us to follow in his steps. Of course, this assumes that Christ was born like we are born, feeling our temptations and experiencing the pull of our desires. Now we went through that already, right? So we know that Christ had that experience. What is possible for us? What is possible for us? Whosoever abided in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth, had not seen him, neither know him. True or false? True. If we abide in Christ, we will not sin. And I want us to think, if we abide in Christ, if we remain connected, that is the only way that we will not sin. If we are in Christ, we are not rebelling against Him. And sin is rebellion. If we abide in Him, we will not sin because He does not sin in us. If Christ is abiding in us constantly, He will not be sinning in us. Thus, as long as we are abiding in Him, we will not be rebelling in our thought or in word or in action. So the key is the uh, continuous abiding in Christ. Is overcoming really possible? Let me hear your answer before I give you the text. You think overcoming is really possible? My brethren, we really have to believe this, eh? Brethren and sisters, we really have to believe this. Else, it makes no sense for us to come Sabbath what Monday, um, Sunday, Wednesday, or go to any church, it'll be a waste of time if we don't believe this is possible. And that is what Christ came to reveal to mankind that it is possible. Let's see what the Bible tells us. To him that overcome it, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. I mean, A, any, any other answer? Let's see. Yes, only overcomers will be in heaven. Only overcomers will be in heaven. Oh, and you notice, you notice, see, right? That's the evangelical gospel. Christ did it. No, so I claim it. I can do whatever I want, but because of what Christ did, he, he did it all. Christ, Jesus paid it all. You see, say that, right? Jesus paid it all. But only overcomers was going to be in heaven. And the mere fact that Christ gave that text to him that overcomes means that he anticipates, he's waiting, and he's showing us that, yes, it is possible that we can be overcomers. The model of overcoming is Christ. And we can overcome sin just as he overcame it. The Bible is full of these promises, and we must not ignore them in an attempt to defend some remaining sins in our lives. Question number eight. What must happen to our thoughts? What must happen to our thoughts? I know that's where sin begins, right? What must happen to our thoughts? Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Answer? See, I'm here to see, let's see. Yes, every thought can be given to Christ. You know, some people believe being, right? Mankind now is thinking this, right? Now this, we, we, are, we, are, we are good, you know, we are inherently good. That's what we are seeing being taught now in schools and the, 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 that's the curriculum and over here, you know, we are inherently good. Follow your heart. You will hear those things. You will see it in the movies, you will see it in the children programs. 
If you follow your heart, it will always guide you rightly. When I hear those things, those things are the exception of, from the pit of hell. What the Bible says about our heart? They are spiritually wicked. Right? And we can't even know it. Right? And some people think that our thoughts cannot be resisted by. If you only know what I was to by, it has no way. When we say things like that, we are saying that, that sin has more power than the gospel. This is one of the most powerful promises in the Bible. God knows that we cannot handle our inmost thoughts, and so he offers us a way of escape. Thank the Lord. He knows that what? It says that he knows that we what? We cannot handle our inmost thoughts. If we understand how beautiful this gospel is, eh? God, if we will just give those thoughts to Christ immediately, he promises to hold them in captivity so that they cannot control us. But we must make the decision to surrender that thought to Christ rather than playing with it and dwelling upon it. So the minute that it comes, we need to just give it to Christ. And he's the one going to hold it captive. If we really want to be Christians, we must be just this serious about our relationship with Christ. Every thought must be in his control at all times. It is self-obvious that if Christ controls all of our thoughts, sin will not be happening in our life. It is what? Self-obvious. And if it's not self-obvious, then a lot of people are under self-deception. Question number nine. Can we walk in the spirit? This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Hmm? Is it the B? Okay. Let's see. Yes, yeah, the answer is B. If we walk in the spirit, we will not sin. If the Holy Spirit is controlling our lives, we will not succumb to the desires of our nature. The Bible is full of promises that we need not fall and fail constantly, over and over again. God promises that we can overcome and that we can gain continual victories in the battle against the flesh. Question number 10. What is our hope of victory? What is our only hope of victory? Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and to keep it. And ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. I think of some Ezekiel chapter 36. So you see who, who does all, who does everything? I will give you. I will put within you. I will put my spirit within you. Who's the idea? God. Right? God. And that was the problem that the Israelites, and probably might say this another time, with the old covenant. Who made the promises in the old covenant? The people. The people made the promises. All the Lord says, we will do. Right? And, and if, we, if we go to that study, we're going to see that. That is the fault that Hebrews talks about. He said that the final fault with them, right? The them there is the people. The people made the promises, and they, you know our promises, right? Promise to do something, and what's happened five minutes after? Going back and do the same thing. But God is the one that He's the one who promises. He's the one who promises. And you know, God, He never goes back any promise, and He always fulfills His promises. A, B, or C. I mean, see. See, see? God answers. Something B, something C. Again, B and C. I mean, C alone, let's see. Yes, a heart transplant is necessary to obey God. And only God can cleanse us from sin. You know, this now has become the, the idea that many people have. If I try harder, I can overcome sin. That is a total failure. And I know most of us experience that already. You cannot try harder to overcome sin. That, I can tell you, will, you will all you will fail our hundred percent every time by trying harder. We need to give our heart to God. It is crucially important that we understand that overcoming is a miracle of God's grace. Just as surely as Peter walking on the water. God 
Overcoming is a what? It's a miracle of God's grace. No amount of self-control will, over, will overcome the pulse of our fallen nature. This has to be a miracle of God from beginning to end. He does the cleansing. He provides the new heart. And He causes us to obey His law. If there is any hope of realizing the promises we have read, then we must take this text very seriously and make this the constant prayer of our lives. Some additional material. A gospel which has become very popular among contemporary Christians says that once we have been justified, remain in a justified or safe condition, even though continuing sin or cherished sin keeps on recurring in the life. In this gospel, the absence of a sanctified heart does not disqualify us for heaven. One author writes, stumbling, this is an author from the contemporary Christian world, stumbling under grace, falling into sin, does not deprive us of justification. Neither does it bring condemnation. When they read those nice books, them books are to go in the fire. This is what one of these pastors of the day are saying, stumbling under grace, falling into sin does not deprive us of justification. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, it does not teach that. But people read that and feel comforted. Well, boy, you know God knows me, and he knows that I'm stumbling, but I'm trying. And, 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 and you notice what it says here? Remain in a justified or safe condition, even though continuing in sin. So, yeah, And if you look at many Christians, that's how they live their lives. They believe that they are saved, but they are doing things that... And sometimes you ask yourself, are these people self-delusional? But brethren, we need to get to the right concept of what God has presented to us in his, in his words. It is quite evident that this idea does not harmonize with what the Bible texts we have been studying in the last few lessons. Isaiah 59 to 1. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Sin always separates us from, from God. I think that needs to be said more and more prominently. When sin is cherished, Satan takes control of the heart, and the Spirit of God is driven out. How could we possibly think that we are in a safe condition while sinning? Self-delusion and rationalization are major components of Satan's attempt to lull us into a false sense of security. Anyone who assures you that there is safety in disobedience is teaching a false gospel, which is far more serious than a false day of worship. Now, all of this could be very discouraging for us, except for one thing, God's love. God is not looking for ways to reject us. He is the seeking God, the one who will not let us go, even when we are rebelling against him. While he cannot save us in sin, he will continue to love and draw us back to him. We see this most clearly in 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And a lot of people don't read this word here. See this word here? They see, they see W-H-E-N. They don't see I-F. If any man sin, not when any man sin. And this is what we want to understand, God's love. God is the one who is seeking after us. He is the one who's he's not looking for ways to reject us. He's looking for ways to do what? To save us. While we were sinning, he came in search of us. We didn't go in search of God. But that is the beauty of God and his love. Clearly, God's purpose for us is that we do not sin. But immediately we see God's mercy in the very next phrase. When we fall into sin because of our carelessness, when we we have one who understands our weakness representing us in the heavenly courts. If we go to him in sorrow and genuine repentance, he will take our case immediately. We need to declare that, the own, that only when our sins are confessed, which is not while we are participating in them, are we accepted by God. When we fall into sin, there are two ways that we can deal with our sin. The human way, Satan's way, is to justify our sin and to excuse it. That is the way of separation from God, and there can be no salvation while separated from Him. The right way is to deal with to deal with personal sin is to recognize it for what it is as soon as it happens within us. We see that once again we are 
dishonoring God and vindicating Satan. And we fall on our knees in deep repentance. There is only one thing that should scare us in this mortal life. And that is watching our hands slip out of the heaven, out of the hand of our Heavenly Father. Immediately we ask God to reach down and grasp our sinking hand and to pull us to safety again. Nothing else matters. Not ego or reputation or image except recognizing, sorry, reconnecting with God. As long as there is connection, as long as the connection is maintained, we have full assurance of salvation. Signs of the time, February 25th, 1892, it says, This means that we have to deal with our personal sins and not just assume that they will go away. We need to allow God to fix the sin problem in us. Just as soon as you commit sin, you should flee right to the throne of grace and tell Jesus all about it. In conclusion, today, let us yield our will to Jesus and allow him to take full possession of our lives. If we will only yield up our will daily to Jesus, we will have power beyond our ability to explain. You all want that kind of power? I want that kind of power. And we will not have to rely on a false gospel to give us a false assurance of salvation. God's way is always better than human devising. And there ends our study for, the, for today. So I pray that we understand the matter of perfection and victory over sin. We saw that perfection, there are, there, are, there are four definitions. We have absolute perfection. And who can only be absolutely perfect? Only God. Right? Only God can be absolute. Then we have what? Nature perfection. Then that is, that is what we receive in the flesh and from within us at the second coming of Christ. Then we have character perfection. Which is what we can deal with now. We can change those things. And victory over sin, we have seen all the texts. And you know that all those texts that we read were promises of God. He is the one who does the work in us and through us. Right? We only have to surrender our wills to him. So my brothers and my sisters, I hope that this encourages you. Please don't rely on that force of that is out there saying that while you're sinning, you will be saved. Anytime you hear that, you know that it's from the pit of hell. You cannot be saved in, while you are sinning. All we need to do is maintain that connection with Christ. And really, if he want to maintain the connection with us, because we know how feeble our hands are, right? We all, our hands will keep sitting out of his hands. Maintain that connection, and we maintain our salvation. So may God bless you all, and I pray that your Sabbath day, as it continues on, will be filled with more blessings than God can give to, give to us as we experience His day. Let us just have a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for what we have studied. And Lord, we know that this concept that we have just gone through is very difficult for some of us to understand and to accept. But Lord, and some, some of these things are very difficult. But Lord, we do not want a force gospel to lull us into believing that we are safe while we are participating in sin. And Lord, the promises that you have given in your word, that you, we can do all things through Christ, that you are the one who keeps us from falling, and you are the one who will present us forthless before your throne. You are the one, Lord Father, who will give us a new heart, and give us a new mind, and you are the one who is going to put your spirit within us. Lord, we see that you are the one who does the work in us and through us, Lord. All we need to do is to maintain that connection, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that all our hearts today, in the hearing of my voice, our hearts will be surrendered to you. We will give our hearts to you, and that, Lord, we will be open to receive the blessings that you have in store for us. So, Lord, may this, what we have studied, become a reality in each one of our lives as we seek to go into that, that statue, that full statue that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.